Welcome, everyone. Uh, we've now reached the final day of Behavioral Science Week, and it's been such a great week with so much fantastic content. Uh, if you want to catch up on any of those sessions, they will all be available online. Um, but today we are here to talk about the application of behavioral science to the movement of people. So migration is a difficult and highly political issue, making it an obvious area where behavioral science can be applied. Uh, we have three presenters with us today. Oscar Pinheiro, who is the head of the Brazil sub-office of UNHCR. He will be giving us a brief introduction into behavioral science and how it applies to migration, and will then show us an example of its application in Brazil. We then have Luca Putterman, who is the Awareness Raising and Communications Officer for IOM. She will be presenting their use of community conversations in Ethiopia to reduce irregular migration. Finally, we have Pia Oberoi, who is the Senior Advisor on Migration and Human Rights for the Asia Pacific region of the Human uh, of the UN Human Rights Office. She will be presenting on their project on changing attitudes towards refugees in Australia and Malaysia. So after, um, please post all of your questions in the Q&A button below, uh, and we'll get to those after the presentations. Uh, so yeah, the, that button. And here's the speaker. So um, Oscar, whenever you're ready, um, take it away. Thank you very much. And yeah, it's a pleasure and thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'll just go maybe a little bit of background into behavioral science, and then I'll talk about how um, UNHR is uh, using it for the refugee and migration context here in Brazil. Um, next slide, please. So what we first, uh, we wanted to uh, know how we could use uh, behavioral science in humanitarian context. So usually, uh, you know, this is more, uh, I mean, talking about the humanitarian sector or development sector, this is more leaning to the development sector, yeah? Because usually when humanitarian emergencies happen, we don't have all this time to, you know, to talk uh, to people at, at length, uh, or we don't have the time to do uh, behavioral audits, which is usually done uh, in, in more um, normal settings. So we wanted to know what, what are the cognitive and psychological factors that underpin human behavior? Uh, so um, for instance, uh, when, when refugees were coming over the border, were they seeking uh, a vaccination to begin with, or they were not, uh, this is the COVID crisis. How were they making decisions? Were there biases, heuristics, influence in, in that decision making? Um, then uh, with our context, we wanted to see what are the, the social and cultural factors that are underpinning those, those behaviors. So uh, when we're talking about the Venezuelans, they were taking some choices that perhaps we as humanitarians were not uh, uh, so sure about. For instance, they were taking um, uh, more than six months to a year in uh, you know, matriculating the children's school. So we wanted to know what was behind uh, those choices given the fact that uh, from all the research we've done and all the consultations we did with communities, uh, many refugees uh, uh, value uh, highly uh, access to education as a priority factor. So why were they taking such a long time to make those choices? Next slide. So uh, why social behavior change is important for, for our sector? Uh, I think uh, understanding, uh, and we do this quite a lot uh, in, in UNHCR, but also in other humanitarian agencies, we, we need to understand what are the perspectives and influence uh, that, uh, that make communities uh, take certain decisions. How do we involve them? How do we involve them in the decisions and the programs that, that we build? And within that, we wanted to build better relationships with you know, the, the people we support. This, uh, in turn, will, should help us you know, to build uh, better relations um, between organizations and also uh, with the refugees and, and migrants we support. And we do this because we want to have an impact. We want to have an impact on our interventions and the well-being of, of the refugees. And more so, uh, we want to make sure that our programming is effective and is sustainable in the long run. Next slide, please. So we developed a, a social behavior change and communication strategy. Uh, now we're in the process of trying to make that a sector-wide, meaning for all the organizations that work in the context in the North, uh, at least for the UN agencies, try to have one strategy that will impact 
you know, this, uh, as I said, this sometimes decisions that uh, refugees make that to us uh, doesn't uh, maximize their protection outcomes. So we did a lot of A-B testing. So, uh, you know, to see what are the um, kind of programs or, or messaging that will uh, impact the most. So how do we reach them with specific, um, you know, messaging and that whether that be uh, through social media or, you know, face-to-face -face or with other type of uh, nudges that we built into the systems. Uh, we wanted to know uh, what is the impact uh, of that uh, communications on the decisions that refugees make. And so uh, we developed this uh, framework that you can see below, uh, which is, you know, the outcomes. So, uh, you know, refugees, Venezuelan refugees in this case and migrants make informed and timely decisions about uh, uh, matriculating their children into school. Uh, and this is a problem that I mentioned before because they were taking a long time. So just to put into context, uh, Venezuelan refugees and migrants come mostly from the north uh, of the country in Brazil. Uh, the most vulnerable are shelter uh, uh, in UNHR shelters. I mean, they're not camps that, you know, people, they're in urban area and people could come in and out, but they take a long time to get matriculated or matriculate the children into school. So we wanted to know why is that taking uh, such a long time. Also, uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, the refugees will have access to employment. So exits from the shelters uh, will become uh, faster and also they will be able to have, uh, you know, sustainable livelihoods uh, where they come. And the last outcome that we wanted to target is because we have uh, over 7,000 uh, indigenous refugees uh, already in Brazil, we wanted to know uh, how do we make those uh, opportunities uh, accessible to indigenous people, which uh, Spanish uh, is not their primary language. So there's this uh, not only language, but a cultural barriers. We understood that, you know, um, when we do this kind of targeting, you have to divide into what we call here is the, the refugee journey. So you cannot target with the same messaging, the people that just arrive with the people that are, have been here for, for a number of years. You know? And sometimes because of, you know, cost implicated and capacities within the teams, we just have uh, wide messages and we don't target specifically within that refugee journey. So what we divided into four, we call it four milestones. Uh, when, when is people arriving in the border, what they need to know about documentation, what they need to know on vaccination. Uh, so that's, you know, very uh, targeted and very kind of simple kind of messaging that people will know. Then arrival and reception, what are the conditions? What are the, can they expect from humanitarians in terms of assistance? This is one of the first three months. And then, uh, you know, emergency and transition phase, which is, you know, okay, how do we go from, from that uh, initial shock to a more transition into more uh, stable, durable uh, solution for them? And then the long-term, how does the life, uh, how, how does the life will look like in Brazil for the, for the, for the years to come? Next, uh, next slide, please. So we develop a number of products, uh, obviously, as in other parts of the world, we have a website, the helpline, but it has been adjusted in terms of language and content uh, to meet the needs. We develop uh, bots. So we have a WhatsApp bot that is, um, you know, uh, speaking or interacting with uh, Venezuelan refugees in their own language with their own kind of cultural understanding of some of this issue. We have a community-based radio. So uh, we develop podcasts and we develop content based on the issues that I said before, uh, vaccination, education, livelihoods, is run by refugees and, and we distribute this in small bites so people be able to transfer those to um, uh, via WhatsApp or other uh, messaging services. And then we have printed material obviously that uh, is in uh, several languages and uh, we have now an increasing Afghan caseload coming to Brazil. So we have also to adjust our, our communication and our, our language uh, uh, to be able to, to meet the needs of those refugees. I think that's, yeah. So, sorry, the primarily findings of the behavioral uh, in our operations. So this, uh, this, uh, this technique of behavioral science provides uh, huge insights on how refugees uh, make decisions. Uh, so we don't have our bias, you know, uh, of what we think they should access, but actually we have information what how they make choices, how refugees make choices. Um, 
by understanding the, the, the cognitive, social, and environmental influences, we're able to better meet and better adjust our interventions to, to have more impact. Um, and then I think it, it encompasses a more uh, systematic um, way to, to engage and embrace the participatory approaches that already uh, embedded within UNHR operations. So uh, as I said before, this not only impacts us uh, in terms of our, our uh, humanitarian activities, but also how do we engage with policymakers about making changes? And for instance, the matriculation, we, we engage with local authorities to make uh, the, the matriculation services easier for, for refugees and migrants to be able to access those services, including uh, doing multi-agency approaches you know, with UNICEF or the IRM and others to make sure that uh, uh, refugees and migrants know how to matriculate and, and they know the times and the steps they need to make. Next slide. Yeah, so that's, that's about it. It's a short presentation and uh, please reach out to us and we'd be happy also to, to provide more information on, on our approach on behavioral science in the humanitarian sector. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Oscar. That was that was great and good emphasis on the importance of uh, engaging with policy to address these problems. Next, we have Luca. Hey, Hi. thank you. Uh, there we go. Uh, oh, yeah, all yours. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, thank you, Oscar, for the presentation. Uh, we're going to move a little bit from refugees to. Um, to migrants, uh, we're going to move from Brazil to Ethiopia. Uh, I want to present you with a very specific case study and a very specific content over a long period of time to actually show a shift in how um, IOM has been using behavioral science to inspire its activities, to inform its activities. It's in a very specific content, but I think it very well illustrates how behavioral science play a role. And for us, that is specifically in activities on awareness raising, so preventing irregular migration in communities. And I call it from dialogue to action. So for you to discover what that means. Let's go, Ash. OK, so community conversation in Ethiopia. This is kind of what it looks like. Try to be in the moment and in the geographical scope that we're looking at. So Ethiopia is a huge country. And this activity, this program has been covering quite a few regions uh, across. So in a nutshell, if you can see the next slide. Thank you. So Community Conversations is a program that is actually today uh, 10 years old. It was officially launched in 2013 by the Ethiopian government, which is important to mention. Actually, the groundwork by IOM started already back in 2009, but very early on, the Ethiopian government had this buy-in and they launched this uh, actually 10 years ago. It's a program that is active in more than 2,500, actually closer to 3,000 villages across Ethiopia. And let's say that a Kabele or a village counts on average 5,000 people. So what happens is that IOM will train uh, community members from those villages, 25 groups of 25 on average, on basic principles of um, guiding this community conversation, on um, peer-to-peer -peer education, on passing information in a trusted, authentic manner. And in this group of people that are trained, you will find diverse profiles of people actually doing this. Um, in this diversity, we will try to reflect the vulnerabilities in, in the communities that we're targeting to make sure that all those needs also are covered and that every voice is being heard. Financial partners over the years have been the U.S. State uh, of Department, uh, U.S. Yeah, Department of State, sorry, and, and the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So let's see how this approach evolved. Let's do a deeper dive. And then you will see that actually before 2013, before the official launch, uh, in Ethiopia, IOM uh, found a shift in the regular departments from urban and suburban areas rather to rural areas. So the communication means that they have in place back then were print, uh, digital media, mainstream media, and the teams realized that in those remote areas, people didn't necessarily have access to the same means and they weren't very much adapt, adopted, adapted to, uh, yeah, to what they were, they were consuming in terms of media. So IOM starts to train people uh, from those communities called community conversation facilitators, still in the assumption back in the days that 
to, in order to change behavior and thus to actually impact the intention to migrate, it's important to provide the information on migration, on the realities, on the risks, on the dangers to really allow people to make one informed decision. So the assumption of the theory of change is that, you know, knowledge, information affects behavior. Again, we had early government buy-in, which really allowed the program to scale up pretty fast and to learn also very fast from different areas. But over time, through the years, it was already noticed on the field by our island officers, but just also from the actual community members facilitating these conversations and working with the community leaders that the information wasn't really what was needed, right? And, and I mentioned it, I think, within the field, this is, I'm not, I'm not saying anything completely new, this is what we know, but it came from the field and it was very clear that actually during these conversations, it wasn't just about information, it was about challenging uh, social norms which were perpetuating these irregular migration patterns. And actually, we also realized that um, the people that we were talking to in these villages with high mobility, they knew about the realities, the risks, the dangers, and it wasn't necessarily this type of knowledge that was holding them back, or it doesn't necessarily affect their attitudes on smuggling or other aspects, uh, or uh, elements that would uh, influence this irregular migration. So gradually, this communication conversations became a platform to challenge those norms within the communities and also those members, they became active voices. They started to criticize certain status quo, also being more critical vis-a-vis -vis the government. And remember that government is really a, an active part of this. They play an active role. And this didn't really put it in, it didn't threat the whole program. It wasn't necessarily a problem. So there was a real dialogue going on. People were questioning their own beliefs, their own norms, and trying to come up with solutions. On top of that, so on top of actually identifying the social norms, we saw a clear spillover from prevention of irregular migration and dialogue to other major island outcomes, being reintegration and development outcomes in the communities, meaning touching upon the root causes of migration. So this community conversation focal points, you know, the, the group of 25 per area that are being trained, they also became the first persons of contact for returning migrants. So Ethiopians from abroad going back to their communities of origins or coming, arriving in a host community, those were the people they would meet and they would then refer them to structures, play a crucial role in their reintegration and also kind of shift those attitudes on reintegration and returning migrants within the community. Besides that, as part of the community conversations is also the development of a community action plan. And we realized that this became an, a real tool for the communities to identify issues, but also solutions and really put it out there and show the local government like, okay, this is what we need, this is what we need to do, and these are the people that are going to do it. So we see this spillover from prevention to reintegration to development outcomes, and that becomes really interesting, right? Like we have this one tool which was developed for a specific reason, but through the understanding of norms and the actual social dynamics, it becomes so much more. So as we move forward to the next slide, so we decided to do uh, a study on the impact of actually the intervention led by our colleagues at GINDAC, the Global Migration Data Analysis Center, and I know Ethiopia. And through this study from a specific uh, period of time with a control group and an intervention group, a few things became clear already in the process. For example, that a large majority of these villages where community conversation was taking place, so almost 70%, they were fully capable to come up with a community action plan submitted to government and also share with community members. And this is independently for I1. So just as a reminder, it's not I1 going into the villages doing this together, it's community conversation facilitators from the communities being trained, rolling this out with community leaders and coming up with this full action plan. And they are capable. That was actually shown by the study. Also, we learned a thing or two about the effectiveness of these community conversations when a government authorities would actively participate, when communities were actively engaged in the plan, and also when uh, these facilitators were younger and more educated in terms of trust of the community. So in terms of key outcomes, on the next slide, we would see a number of things, and I apologize, there's way too much text, but since it is a study, I cannot just like narrow it down in, uh, in a few words. So for you to read the whole picture, but in a nutshell, what we learned, or what was confirmed in this study, which we already intuitively had understood also through these facilitators, is that just the sharing of knowledge or having this conversational group doesn't necessarily 
in fact, the intentions to migrate irregularly. There wasn't an effect that could really be shown statistically. Also, it didn't necessarily increase the knowledge of irregular migration patterns, of migrant rights abroad, etc. What was perceived is that the people in those communities would have better access to information on legal pathways, and that they felt more comfortable um, asking information about migration and confident in actually being able to find this information. So one might ask, what is more important? Having the knowledge right now and having the effect of being able to get the knowledge at the right time. Also, uh, it was found that those communities who were actively participating in community conversations, they had a more positive attitude towards returnees and the support that they might need in the reintegration process. And there was also an increase in trust towards authorities. So we have more active citizens asking for more, being more vocal, but also trusting more the government. So this actually was a very interesting side effect. So what we learned or what was confirmed and that helped us further define how we could use this community conversations is that information alone is not enough. And I want to make like a side drawing here saying that there is other studies from other interventions where we do different approaches that show that in certain ways from peer to peer education, information can have an effect on the attention to migrate. But in this case, information is not alone, but a necessary step to start actually changing or challenging these social norms and also opening up opportunities to the communities to define safer pathways, to define development outcomes. And then what is interesting is that in 10 years again, we should go back and look whether we have an effect of irregular migration. So maybe someone is not today changing their intention to migrate based on the information, but they're working together to create a new environment, which probably hopefully wouldn't need irregular migration anymore because there's so many alternatives available, including legal migration pathways. So as a final conclusion from the next slide, few key lessons. I actually want to start with the third. Change takes time. Um, I chose this case study very specifically. I'm today coordinating activities in more than 14 countries. But this is the one that's been going on for so long. And when often in the UN or beyond, we speak of innovation, we think about piloting new approaches, the fancy idea, the scientist who comes in and comes with this whole wow effect. And it's not always the, the project that sounds less sexy I've been around for so long that we want to feature, but actually this is how change works. It works organically, it works over time. Innovation takes time. This was one approach that was implemented over more than 10 years. It survived several projects, it survived several donors. People are doing it in so many places just because they kept adapting, learning and going there together. And this would not have been possible, and I really want to mention it, without the help of a very important national staff member, Ms. Diana, who is hopefully on call today, who has more than 20 uh, years of experience in IOM. And those people are so important in order to make sure that our innovative initiatives are sustainable, because they are the ones that are also in connection with governments. And that's the second point. If you get governments on board early, you increase the level of trust, not with IOM, but also with the communities. There's more engagement and it's not necessarily threatening. So we shouldn't be hesitant to keep them, to take them on board very early on, even when we start doing the study, even when we start understanding, because there is a way to actually evolve together. And right now it is the government requesting us to make changes. And then the last point that I wanted to highlight is that communities are capable. So they can do the whole development process themselves from identification to creating the plan to implementation. So we should be there also to make that possible. And this is the final step of where we are today. Well, hopefully not final, but today's step is that right now in Ethiopia, we are running a community-based planning pilot, meaning that those communities who came up with their community action plan through the community conversation can now submit it, not just to the Ethiopian government, but also directly to IOM, so that we can access the resources that we have from our donor and actually make them available directly to the communities as an implementing partner to develop those initiatives according to their budgets and manage all the resources themselves, including accountability mechanisms, ME, and that type of information that comes back to us. So I don't want to make it any longer. I have another slide of further reading, which will be shared afterwards, and I'm happy to take questions on this, or on more generally outcomes uh, from our impact evaluations of awareness raising after the last presentation. Thank you very much and over to you, Ash.
Thank you so much, Luca. That was that was great. And I hope that you still do some innovative, sexy projects despite these findings. Um, next, we have Pia. Over to you, Pia, to talk about uh, and moving across to uh, Asia Pacific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, we're moving now to the Asia Pacific. Um, and I want to just start with a, a little caveat. And um, we're looking at understanding and influencing public attitudes on migration and people on the move in the, the region. And my caveat is that we, of course, also did not do this alone. We had some amazing partners. And also, I personally am not a behavioral science expert. I just really came across along for a very interesting ride. So maybe if we can go to the next slide, please, uh, Cash. So we started with, uh, in, in this region, we started with a, a particular problem, which is of course not relevant only to this region. The problem being that public narratives on migration are hostile and they lead to discrimination and negative policy outcomes for people on the move in two countries. So we, we focused on Australia and Malaysia uh, as our two pilot countries. Um, and you know, in the rubric of people on the move, we're looking at undocumented migrants, we're looking at asylum seekers, we're looking at low wage, migrant workers and really, you know, people that are on the move in situations of vulnerability and that they are disproportionately affected, their rights are disproportionately affected uh, by these, these negative narratives um, that, that we're talking about. Um, and what we really wanted to ask is um, in kind of making uh, messaging that is uh, uh, relevant to change these narratives, who is our target audience and what would make them change uh, attitudes? And we did this um, building on some work that we've been doing for, for a long time now, for about uh, five or six years, on um, narrative change uh, related to migration and how human rights principles, including the principle of do no harm, are built in, can be built into uh, interventions on narrative change. So really we're looking to, to craft rights-based messages uh, to, to make this change. And I should say as well that um, Narrative change is, of course, part of a range of interventions that should be taking place at a range of levels to kind of get to the, the rights-based uh, change that we need. So um, fully aware that, of course, you know, what we're trying to do in terms of public narrative change isn't going to be the only intervention that we should make. And of course, OHCHR does um, engage on you know, a wide variety of legislative and policy uh, interventions uh, on this. The other thing that I should say is that um, a lot of this work is, is uh, whereas it's more advanced in other regions, for instance, in Europe, um, it's relatively nascent in, in Asia um, and the Pacific. And so we were kind of, you know, trying really to see, well, what, what could work and how could we capacitate our partners um, to, to take this change further on? So we worked with two partners um, in, in uh, the different contexts. We work with Love Frankie Limited, which is a social impact communications agency based in Asia Pacific uh, for the research and campaign rollout in Australia. And we worked with Untitled Company um, to produce content in Malaysia and, and roll the campaign out. So I'll take you through now uh, how we work. So maybe we can go to the next slide, please, Cash. So, Basically, this is what we did. Um, you know, the, the 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 steps on this slide is 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 how we we went about it, and we will uh, publish a report hopefully uh, within the next few months, essentially telling this story as a way as well to help uh, our partners, particularly in civil society, and um, kind of you know start to use some of these uh, methodologies in the work that they do to 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 bring human rights change. So I'll start just very quickly with contextual research, um, which was basically desk research, key informant interviews, stakeholder mappings, essentially to further populate and to disaggregate the problem assessment that we come up with. You know, what are these hostile narratives? Where are they most prolific? What kinds of harms do they perpetuate, et cetera? So we'll go to the next step now, please, Cash, um, which is uh, conducting uh, quantitative surveys. And there's a, there was a lot uh, that we tried to do in these surveys, um, working, uh, we were working in the COVID, uh, this, this research, the service took place in 2021, beginning of 22. Uh, and of course we were deep in the middle of COVID then. So they were conducted online um, in English in Australia and Bahasa Malay in Malaysia with uh, about uh, 1200 respondents um, in each. And really what we were trying to do to understand the audience's values uh, on migration and also to see where there were areas of agreement and commonality in relation to, to what they thought about migration, but also where there were um, issues of concern. 
And we use the rubric of people from other countries because we really didn't want to lean into, you know, kind of the kinds of categories that, that we all work with in terms of, you know, when we're doing legal interventions. We didn't want to lean into categories categories that could be loaded um, or divisive. I mean, we come at it obviously from the UN Human Rights Office's side, from the universal human rights umbrella um, to, to try to understand where we could make some, some difference. I don't have time to go through many of the findings, but, but maybe just one to highlight um, is about uh, the, the number of people, the percentage of people that agreed strongly, very strongly or somewhat strongly that uh, people contributed, people on the move from other countries contributed positively to the economy and the society. So it was about 59% in Australia, 52% in Malaysia. So these were already quite um, encouraging findings to try to find these areas of commonality, the hope-based values uh, that really were in line with uh, the, 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 the pathway that, that we at OHCHR you know, hope to make uh, to bring some change. And we also included questions on what made people more or less supportive on migration in order to build uh, the, the, the messaging going forward. So the next step then, if we go to the next slide, step three was uh, finding um, a persuade, the, the persuadable audience. You know, what do they look like? Who are they? What, what are their values? Um, we, it revealed that about half of Australians and about two thirds of Malaysians are in what we called Swayable or persuadable middle. So people that um, are likely, um, you know, given that the messaging would appeal to them, likely to experience some change in their attitudes uh, on the issue of migration. And there would be then on the other side, uh, migrant champions who we believe would be, you know, on board with the, the rights-based messaging. Um, and then people that we kind of broadly put into a category of anti-immigration who are unlikely to change uh, their attitudes because they're quite uh, fixed on both sides. They're quite fixed uh, in these attitudes. So um, what we did um, in, in kind of, you know, getting these, these broad categories um, of concerned sympathizer, hesitant supporter, and in Malaysia, particularly hesitant skeptics, was really to to write up with Love Frankie's um, help, write up hypothetical uh, portfolio uh, profiles of, of individuals in each category, really in a way to try and understand the target audience uh, better, to, to, to understand, you know, for instance, um, the, the media that they, that they respond to, um, how they get their news and opinions, of course, age and gender, and the kinds of issues, most importantly for us, the kinds of issues that would make them feel more supportive to, to migration, to the human rights um, of people on the move. Which is where we move then into the next step, which is step four, the next slide, and that was to identify common values to design uh, narrative messaging. Um, and we did this in, in different, took slightly different directions um, in the two countries. And again, I think, you know, in telling the story, it's important as well to tell about you know, the roadblocks or the, 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 the different paths that, that come up. Um, we, we realized in Australia, which is a quote unquote developed market in order to make some inroad into the information um, kind of uh, infrastructure ecosystem, um, it would be important to partner with a number of specialized actors such as public relations uh, agencies, et cetera. Whereas in Malaysia, what we wanted, um, even though we, of course, worked with CSOs and others in Australia and Malaysia, it was very important for us that the campaign be developed with local actors um, from a capacity building perspective, but also in terms of authentic voice. And so we, we leaned more into working with uh, CSOs and, and uh, other actors, uh, more grassroots uh, in, in that way. So we had kind of uh, two different ways in which we identified these common values in Australia, we synthesized the quantitative survey and key informant interview results. Whereas in Malaysia, we actually went uh, to an online moderated platform, a focus group um, in, in, in two ways. And what we tried to do through these different um, uh, approaches was to understand the values, the, the, the values that are most important uh, to uh, the, the target audience, to build a picture really, um, as, as we say in the, the seven key elements uh, document that, that I referred to at, at the beginning of uh, the, the first slide, is to build a picture of the world you want to see. And that was important for us because what we're trying to do is really, as I said, lean into this hope-based messaging idea um, that a lot of human rights work tends to 
talk about the world that is that the things that we want to change. Um, but what we really wanted to do here was to paint a picture of how communities can come together. And so the values that are important to the target audience was important to build into that picture. Um, and, and, you know, to find things like how to find common ground and build a big tent. Um, and we found, which is, I guess, not surprising for those of us from the region, that food is an issue that that uh, unites, um, you know, people both in Australians and Malaysians, and it ref uh, reflects really the multicultural roots um, of of both countries. So we decided to uh, build, in a sense, you know, the the, the campaigns around uh, coming together over sharing uh, meals. So the next step that we went to after kind of coming through this, if we go to the next slide, please, Cash, was to test the message that we had we had developed as a result of you know this the, the, the information that we had uh, uh, gathered, and in Malaysia we uh, were, you know tested the message through the focus groups of the previous step. The message being we share more in common than what divides us, um, and we were told that the message does reflect shared values and human stories. Um, in one, one of the respondents, the participants in the focus group says that it takes unity to walk a further distance than walking alone. On the other hand, in Australia, what we did is that we uh, launched a quantitative online survey with about a thousand uh, people and we tested two messages. Um, and again, in Australia, the, the idea of commonality, we have more in common than what divides us. Every migrant has a story of hope, courage, despair, success and failure, don't we all? with 68% saying that it would be more likely, this message would be more likely to interest them to hear stories of people from other countries. So we, we came to these two um, uh, campaign messages uh, from that. And then what we did in the next step was that we moved to looking at, to choosing messengers. Um, and this also comes from some previous research that we have done and that you know many, many others have done which is to say that messengers are often as important as the message. Who is able to speak credibly to your target audience um, is, is as important. And what we had done, of course, through the various steps before in the research that we'd been doing uh, and the outreach uh, to, to the target audience had included questions on this throughout the research process and also included questions on what would be trusted media um, for the, the, the target audience. And I should say, um, of course, that, as I said, because the research was taking place during uh, the, the pandemic, um, of, we, we, we realized even <laughs> though we were told by 58% in, in Australia and 64% of Malaysia that they really trusted social media, we would have had to do it as an online um, experiment in any case. But we learned about you know, the kinds of people that would be trusted messengers. So in, in Australia, pop culture influencers and opinion leaders were, were you know, kind of uh, really brought up through the research, celebrities and news anchors in Malaysia. And interestingly enough for us, um, there was a divergence in terms of whether the United Nations was a trusted messenger. So this was very much seen in Australia as a trusted messenger, whereas in Malaysia, we were told that it would be better um, to, to um, showcase and highlight uh, the, 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 the communities, the partners, the Malaysian um, CSOs and uh, influencers that uh, we've been working uh, with. So that is what we did in the last step, the last two steps. And that's my final slide. And um, this should say step seven and eight, by the way. So it was design the campaign and uh, then we get to measuring impact. So we, we launched between last uh, 2022 uh, and the beginning of this year, we launched two uh, campaign, um, a series of, of, of uh, campaign videos in uh, Australia. It was called My Great Story. Um, and and uh, told the story of uh, migrant, uh, uh, so, so people with migrant backgrounds um, from these, these uh, messengers, uh, pop culture and, and uh, different uh, other uh, celebrities, meeting and sharing a meal and talking about, you know, their migrant experience, their migration experience, their refugee experience, um, and, and um, you know, kind of telling the story of migration in that way. Um, and in uh, Malaysia, we launched the Dari Dapo campaign, uh, which again had um, uh, celeb so Malaysian celebrities or Malaysian uh, in, in the picture there, you see a, a very famous actress and a, 
so, uh, and a uh, comedian that are meeting a Cambodian uh, or Indonesian migrant worker. So it was really about, again, you know, kind of meeting people where they are, talking about, you know, the experiences of migration and, and uh, building communities. Um, the, the, the idea was that, uh, you know, that, that they would meet over food and things that uh, people have in common. Um, and just a very quick note on, on some uh, impact measurement, you, know, you can see that they're on the slide. In Australia, again, we ran, uh, uh, we have run an evaluation survey where um, there was uh, some uh, increase, uh, not just in the support for migrants and migration, but also in the confidence to discuss topics related to this issue with friends and family, uh, a, a, li a greater likelihood to engage with topics related to migration or migrants' rights, um, which was also important. And we will be running a, a similar evaluation survey um, in, in Malaysia shortly. So I just want to, to end uh, really with uh, the, 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 the idea, I think Luca said it earlier, that change takes time. And, and rights-based narrative change really is a long-term process. You know, we weren't expecting to kind of see, oh, well, now everything's fine and all the policy changes have been made in these countries and, and, and we're all good. But we wanted really to, to try to, to put some, um, a, you know, just to make some progress in, in what are quite intractable often um, public narratives. So for instance, in Malaysia, we've already been um, very pleased to see that um, the, the Dari Dapo uh, video episodes have been taken up by some of the channels viewed by target, the target audience, mainstream media channels, Astro Awami or Bernama, where, where there, there could be, you know, uh, that, that we're coming to meet people where they are. We're not insisting that they come, you know, to, to the right space platform immediately. And what we will then be doing um, uh, now following uh, these two almost pilot experiments is that um, we're writing this up, the, this story um, uh, through a publication to really to help particularly our civil society partners, but also uh, government partners um, and others, national human rights institutions and others that might be interested to, to look at, to, to use these methods and to understand that there's what we're doing in the publication is, is, is pointing at different ways. Some of it can be very resource intensive. There are ways in which you can make it less resource intensive. How do you lean into partnership um, and, and uh, community? Um, and we hope to replicate it uh, possibly in other contexts in the Asia Pacific region, in South Asia, possibly in, in India. So um, I'll stop there, uh, Cash, and of course, very happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Mia. Uh, yeah, so we have some questions now. Um, I'd invite the speakers to turn on their camera and we can try and tackle some of these. Uh, the first one is quite a general question, which is to, uh, could you tell us what criteria you use to designate migration as irregular versus regular? Um, Oscar, can I direct this towards you? So the, the issue about direct migration, regular, irregular. Regular, yeah. irregular. How, how you designate migration as irregular or regular? Oh, you're asking the wrong person. So this uh, you need charge. So I'll give you the the you know our yeah, presentation sorry. of that. Um, so refugees are refugees because of the convention, the the five criteria of the convention and persecution and well-founded fear. So these are not irregular migrants. These are refugees uh, if they meet the cost. In terms of Venezuelans, uh, um, the Brazilian government and in the region, we have a, a, an additional protective mechanism. So uh, apart from the 51 convention, refugee convention, sorry, uh, we also have the Cartagena declaration. So uh, people fleeing generalized violence, such as the case in Venezuela, have access to uh, international protection. Yeah. Uh, we do, I mean, th this is the, in behavioral science, this is something that is up and coming and, and people should be aware of because some governments are uh, targeting specific flows uh, to motivate them not to seek asylum. So you have governments, especially in Europe, but in other, other parts of the world, uh, sending direct messages, radios, uh, Facebook, social media, telling people in that particular region, say, 
Syria or, or the, not to make the journey onwards to Europe because they will not get asylum. And this is very tricky. That's why we as humanitarians, we in the, in the, in the system, UN system, should be aware that you know, governments are employing these mechanisms, social behavior, to negate an international, uh, international rights and international norms and international law. Yeah? So we should be able to also have the tools uh, to be able to mitigate this and be able to you know, communicate uh, people's uh, right to seek asylum. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't answer correctly your, your answer, but I give you my UNHCR's perspective. Yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Luca, you half answered this question already, but um, have IOM and UNHCR collaborated on a behavioral science project about refugees or migrants so far? Um, yeah, you, you, you wanted to talk about a project, so please go ahead. Yeah, I thought like the best way to do it is, is to start by an example, right? Um, there's actually been one that I've been involved in like directly. Uh, it was 10 years ago as well. <laughs> I'm only speaking about the past, but no, it's, it's, it's very up to date. Uh, there was a small initiative in, in Morocco to paint the context a little bit. We're in Rabat. And in that area, there are quite a few sub-Saharan migrants uh, who are there to potentially or not, or they want to stay in the country, or maybe their goal is to uh, cross the Mediterranean to, into Europe, but also in the same areas where they reside in this Moroccan city, they will cohabit with um, refugees, obviously. And back in the days, I was actually working for UNHCR, and we were facing an issue of violence and discrimination against, especially these minor um, refugees, unaccompanied minors who were living in these areas, and they were facing these very important challenges. Uh, so we come up with a solution um, at the community level, which became like a large scale uh, basketball program, actually, in four uh, key areas. Uh, two, like it was three trainings rolled out over eight weeks and a big tournament at the end. But uh, the key here is that if you look at the real issue, where this discrimination came from is not people, these minors, these youngsters who are not discriminated against because they were refugees. They were discriminated against because they were sub-Saharan Africans and very specifically on the color of their skin um, and that doesn't make them any difference from the same young people same age same profiles who are not refugees or asylum seekers but migrants so they were all living together in the same area and actually also having the same issues to deal with with the young Moroccans in this area so it's all mixed so the solution was also to open it up to anyone refugee migrant uh, young Moroccan, any nationality there. And that was a very interesting way to do that. And actually right now this initiative kept, keeps going as well. Uh, and it kind of answers to another question as well, like how do you make initiative sustainable? I think because it was a good idea with lots of good uh, partners on the ground and it became sustainable. And it kind of went over in a ping pong situation from UNICHAR, then there was ILO supporting it, then there was UNICEF who did it once. And so it's really an initiative that targeted vulnerable youth, including these different groups. So it happened in the past, and I think we are very much open to work on that type of initiatives with UNHCR, especially when looking at youth and protecting uh, vulnerable individuals on the move, whether they are migrants, irregular migrants, asylum seekers, uh, refugees, that big group, when there is vulnerability, we are here to, to support. And now maybe quickly on the question of irregular migration, as a YOM, I can share like what the definition is. I think we use that term uh, to make a difference with safe and orderly migration. So a regular migration would be a form of uh, migration that is maybe undocumented, and where the person, because of those reasons, might also be facing certain uh, risks on their road. And so that's something that we want to avoid at all costs. Uh, and therefore, I will always promote migration. So we will always want more migration, but regularly and safe. And dignified migration. Yeah, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, Pia, this is a question about methodology, which I appreciate. Um, you had a lot of partners that you worked with, but let's let's try. Um, what advice would you share with those of us wanting to start an online experiment? Um, equally, there are a, a few other questions on methodology for you, such as like, do you expect this change to be lasting? And like, when did you measure the change? I feared that I was starting talking about methodology would get me questions about methodology. <laughs> um, no, listen, I mean, I think that um, it was really important for us. To, I just want to say it was really important for us to do this just because normally as, as human rights actors, we, we think we know what the messaging should be that comes from the human rights framework. And so we, you know, we, we, we go with that. 
Um, I think the advice that I would give about somebody wanting to start and some, something similar like this is to really know what your resources are. I mean, again, you know, this, like I said, a lot of this can be incredibly resource intensive, but it can also, there, there are also different ways that you can kind of, you know, compensate for not having uh, the money to, for instance, launch very big uh, quantitative surveys. So I would um, really kind of think about what your resourcing is, uh, resourcing base is, and, and what partners you can work with. Uh, again, you know, working with a range of different partners, given that we didn't have a lot of resources to do this ourselves was really, really important. So I think it's kind of getting your ducks in a row before you launch in. Um, the question, if I may, Cash, just about the, 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 the few other methodology um, issues. Um, the, the measurement in Australia, um, we, we measured uh, very shortly after the, the last video drop, which was in a matter of weeks, um, but that was about two months or so after the first video had been shown. So it, it was it was relatively close uh, and, and bearing in mind, of course, that, you know, we, we expect this change to not happen that uh, quickly. Um, we, we had built in some calls to action around um, through the videos around essentially asking people to, you know, meet. So not about big policy changes, but it was about kind of building community. So, you know, what can you do to meet people that are, you know, uh, on the move? Where can you find them? What things like that? So I think building those calls to action in um, is really um, uh, important. And the step that was hardest uh, for me personally was the methodology because I don't know much about it. But um, I think we found it interesting that step from the research and getting the research findings and translating them into messaging, just because it's not something that a lot of the, that neither us nor a lot of our partners are that familiar with. What we've you know, often done is we've, we've created the messaging out of human rights guidance and uh, you know, kind of ethical ideas about how to engage with people. But it was very interesting and, and quite difficult to, to translate uh, the, the, all the, 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 the different um, opinions that have been shared with us uh, and to learn those values and translate them into uh, messages. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bea. Um... Oscar, you're answering some, you're already answering great questions yourself. So I'm going to redirect the, the next question to Luca, which is on how do you think IOM can better use data and behavioral science together? That's an interesting one, right? Um, I think I can start from how we are doing it uh, right now. First, there's the data on movement, and, and it becomes interesting because often there's different departments working on different things, and we're all from the sector, so uh, we can understand the institutional complexity sometimes. So we use data from the data tracking mechanism on outgoing uh, people moving across, across borders to actually understand where the highest um, mobility rates are. And those are the communities that we will target in our interventions. And you will see across the country, it can be very uh, scattered. Like it doesn't necessarily follow a strict pattern. Like sometimes you have a region with almost no migration at all, and then there can be one community with very high outcome or inbound migration rates. So we're looking at people coming back, returning. So we're looking at people leaving, uh, transiting, uh, traveling within the region and across. So that's one thing, like we use the data to understand, okay, where should we be working? Where's more effective? Where's the actual need? Like where are people leaving from and why? So first that's just the data on, on movement, let's say, which is very physical. And then the second type of data can go through surveys um, that can more try and be trying to measure certain norms and values, which is not that easy to quantify. It will be more entering the, 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 the area of like qualitative research. But there are a few things, as you can see through these impact evaluations, that are quantifiable. We can actually look for statistically relevant effects on the intentions to migrate. So we can use it before to understand where we're going, after to measure the impact of our interventions, but also during to kind of take the temperature and measure like what are we doing is right. But I must say it's not always easy because using data means you need a lot of data. And very often our interventions are super localized, so they don't necessarily lend themselves to this kind of like big data thing that comes from you know the digital world, social media, where we speak about mass data, and then you can get really interesting effects, which is not always the case for us. Over. Thank you, Luca. Oscar, please. Sorry, if I, in, on the social media, I may, if I may compliment it, because I was uh, deployed to to um, Europe for the uh, for the Ukraine crisis. 
So what we started to do there is that, you know, a lot of us working with uh, social media to be able to see movements of people. So this is where, you know, the use of data becomes interesting in terms of specific targeting. So, uh, you know, you have a lot of, um, you know, intention behavioral gaps, uh, you know, uh, friction costs as well. You have also what we call present bias within the, the, the social behavior mechanism. So what we do is that we collect that data. We, we were seeing the movements of uh, Ukrainian refugees, you know, arriving in Poland, but then going afterwards to, to Germany, going afterwards to other parts of Europe. So at every stage of the, of the path of the refugee journey, you can actually then target specific messaging for those people. So in terms of uh, for instance, if we're talking about present bias, well, is there is there a, uh, a way that we could tell them that, you know, um, to take that that decision will have an impact on the future. So, for instance, seeking asylum will have an impact on the on their reg regular process or or their their status within the within the country. So that's why we you know we we, we then can message either through you know uh, meta ads or we can message through, through Google ads or we we can message through uh, individual uh, phone messaging. Uh, to tell people to make better decisions on, on that. Same thing with friction costs. If you see within the data that uh, people are not taking a decision because of the, um, the setup of your intervention, you see where, where are the people having friction with the, with the system. And then you could then uh, adjust uh, that system. So in terms of matriculation, uh, can we have, you know, as we did in many parts of, uh, of Europe, uh, documentation translated into Ukrainian, so people will have better access to education services or to employment services. So that's a, that's an easy kind of thing. But the data where we, we were collecting, especially with uh, social media, allowed us to pinpoint specific areas that you know information uh, and social behavioral change communication strategies could be implemented. Back to you. Excellent, excellent point. Um... I guess we have time for one last question. Um, so in addition, so great to hear that you've managed to sustain the approach through projects and donors. I think that was directed towards Luca, but I'd like to kind of expand this to, to everyone or anyone that has that wants to response, respond. Uh, in addition to individual rock stars driving it, which I'm assuming is the three of you, uh, what are critical factors to achieve this? So yeah, so what are some critical factors to finding success in your projects. Um, any, anyone have an immediate response? Thank you, Pia. If, if just very quickly, because um, one of the things that I didn't say that we did with this um, with this work is that we engaged with the media in different ways at the ends, uh, towards the ends of each campaign. Um, but um, interestingly, not just, you know, as like I said, the, the media that uh, the target audience consume, but we also engaged with content creators in the online space. And we ran, um, we're, we're working now with um, uh, organizations that are running uh, capacity building for refugee and migrant populations themselves to become content creators. Because again, what we learned in the research was that and so much of the, the news and the opinions that the target audience for, comes from that online space. It's not just the broadsheets and you know things like that. So that's very important to take that you know that that lasting impact i think is also to, to figure out different ways of keeping that momentum going thank you uh yeah please ask her now uh, pierre is this a very important point i mean i'm of an age that i still read newspapers to get my information and I'm, uh, I'm quite old but you know when we did research you know most of the people get the information from social media or through whatsapp messaging so in brazil we 60 uh, percent of the people get the news content from uh, private chats and whatsapp so uh, getting involved with influencers getting involved with those uh, networks is extremely important so you know, we might think, okay, putting out an opinion uh, page on the Wall Street Journal will influence people. Probably not, you know, this is not where we're going. With one specific campaign that costs very little uh, through through social media with Meta in particular, we were able to reach 50,000 people. Yeah? And we were able to get the metrics of, you know, uh, did these people then uh, make choices? Now, uh, make choices in terms of accessing information or, or you know, accessing services. Now, what is critical, uh, going back to the original question, Cash, is, is what is critical is that we have studies that prove 
that you know based on the information you provided the the, the you know based on the uh, the content you provided people make uh, different choices and then it goes back to to Lucas point about uh, you know uh, it takes time you know you don't don't expect by sending out you know thousands of you know uh, uh, Facebook ads that uh, people's behavior will change us that you know probably many of us here are uni university trained have habits that are harmful to to us you know we eat things that probably, probably we shouldn't or we drink things that we shouldn't and it takes a long time for us to get convinced that you know that's in probably not the right path so it is it is uh, as i put in my presentation you have to target specifically within the milestone um of of people's lives within the the interaction with that to particular humanitarian assistance and within that then we we have to get the metrics so in order for this to be sustainable and to get donors attention and funding uh, we need to make uh, studies that will prove the impact uh, of our interventions and that, that is quite difficult at the moment thank you so much oscar um final words Luca? yeah maybe just like i think the study is definitely the study is definitely one thing I, I must like put a little bit in parenthesis we did quite a few that also takes time for the result to be and like in my in my experience also just tend to reopen the debate and like the more that we actually publish the studies showing that awareness raising does have an impact and then we could really show the difference statistically through the ones that I that I mentioned there well we actually saw the funding going down for that type of campaigns so it doesn't necessarily have a direct link so in terms of sustainability and the question of, of rock stars uh, I think rock stars are definitely good uh, but it's also a matter of having a lot of them not just one person but like making sure that everyone gets at that level and knows how to do things but generally I think what can make a, a an idea that we can make a project last is first that it's a good idea. From the moment, in, from the first step, it needs to be a good idea. And we need to have the courage also to say when someone comes up with a new idea, including myself, sometimes you pitch something. If it's not good, like don't do it. Just don't even start because it will, it will take more effort to keep it going, right? I think the second point for me is that it should be open to adapt. The project that I was, uh, that I was showing to you has been going on for 10 years. It is far from what it is in the beginning. So instead of saying, you know what, this doesn't work anymore, let's just throw it out, give me a new name, do something else with different people. Let's say, okay, this may not work anymore. Let's keep the name. Let's keep the people. Let's see how we're going to adapt and make sure that it stands with time. The biggest brands of our time, the most known concepts of our time, we spoke in Wall Street Journal or Washington Post, I know those names because they're still around and they've been able to adapt. So that's something that we need to do. And then my third point would be linking with governments and local partners because then it's them that will ask for you to keep doing it. And then you can submit that request to your donor and say like, you know, it's not me. They need to do it. Like government wants to do it. Partner wants to do it. So we need to do it and you should be funding it. And that in my experience, it worked for us a few times. We're very happy to have like content that we kept doing and platforms that we built that actually survived a few program cycles. We are IOM, highly projectized. It's a number one challenge if you want. Uh, but there were a few things that we can really get going, I think maybe because of those criteria, but it is far from easy. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Luca. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. Um, yeah, it's, I'm sure this conversation will continue on for a while. But thank you so much to the three presenters. Uh, have a lovely day. Take care.